uh, welcome to the Federal Society Young Legal Scholars Paper Presentations Panel. Um, I'm Lauren Solom from Georgetown University Law Center. Uh, I'm going to introduce the panel, and, uh, uh, and then we will have uh, two uh, sessions, so to speak, uh, uh, and I'll explain that as I go along. Okay. Uh, so uh, our speakers are in alphabetical order, uh, Christian Bursett from Notre Dame Law School, uh, Mihalis Diamantes from the University of Iowa College of Law, Michael Morley from Florida State University College of Law, Ryan Williams from Boston College Law School, and Elian Werman from Arizona State University, Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. Uh, and we have a wonderful set of commentators with, with present company accepted. Um, uh, Sean Griffith from Fordham University School of Law, Tara Lee Grove, whom I seem to be on everything with, <laughs> uh, uh, from William and Mary Marshall Wythe School of Law, and in place of John Harrison, who was on the program, uh, uh, we are uh, very fortunate to have uh, Philip Hamburger from uh, Columbia University, and uh, I will be the final commentator. So um, here's how it's going to work. Um, uh, Michael Moore, Morley is going to present for 10 minutes, and then Tara will comment for eight minutes, and then Ryan Williams will present for 10 minutes, and uh, uh, Tara will comment again for eight minutes, um, and then we'll take a break. Tara and I will uh, switch roles. I will no longer be moderator. I will be the commentator for the second half of the program, uh, which will include uh, the presentation by uh, Christian Brissett with me giving comments, Mihalis Diamantis with Sean Griffith giving comments, Ilyan Werman with uh, Philip Hamburger giving comments. So with that, all of that organizational stuff out of the way, our first speaker is Michael Moore. Thank you very much. Last term in Common Cause versus Rucho, the Supreme Court held that the US Constitution does not create a justiciable cause of action against <coughs> political gerrymandering. It held that political gerrymandering claims under the federal constitution are <coughs> non-justiciable political questions. Many scholars and activists in response have advocated turning instead to state constitutions as, cre as prohibiting state legislatures from engaging in political gerrymandering. With regard to redistricting for state legislatures themselves, as well as uh, local jurisdictions, such a move is unremarkable. The main argument of my paper is that state constitutions may not be used to limit political gerrymandering with regard to congressional elections because state constitutions cannot limit, are categorically incapable of limiting the substantive scope of authority that state legislatures possess to regulate federal elections. And the reason for this stems from the US Constitution. The elections clause in Article I of the Constitution states that the legislature of each state shall regulate the time, place, and manner of congressional elections. And similarly, the presidential elect electors clause of Article II states that the legislature of the state will regulate the manner in which, in which presidential electors are selected. Whereas most um, other provisions of the Constitution refer to the state as an entity and, <coughs> and grant powers or impose restrictions on states as entities, the Elections Clause and the Presidential Electors Clause pierce the veil of statehood, so to speak, to specifically delegate authority directly from the US Constitution, specifically to the state legislature, and therefore a state constitution is simply legally incapable of right, imposing substantive restrictions on the scope of that authority. The Supreme Court largely rejected this doctrine in a 2015 case, a five to four decision with Justice Kennedy joining the majority called Arizona State Legislature versus Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission. It gave this issue very short shrift, however, and it rejected this, what I refer to as this independent state legislature doctrine, the notion that when regulating federal elections, the legislature acts inde independently of the state constitution. It rejected this doctrine without an understanding of its historical pedigree, 
and without even engaging with the normative rationales underlying it. And so this paper seeks to, to use the classic law professor phrase, fill that gap. It, <laughs> it argues that throughout the 19th century, to the extent this issue arose, the prevailing understanding, the prevailing interpretation of the elections clause within the Supreme Court, within state Supreme Courts, within the chambers of Congress, within other legal sources, was the independent state legislature doctrine. That the Supreme Court's rejection of that doctrine in the, in the 20th and 21st century was an ahistorical misinterpretation of the Constitution. So I don't have time in this presentation to, to go through the laundry list of historical examples, so I'll just hit on a few of the highlights. One of the earliest is in 1820, during the Massachusetts Constitutional Convention, when in the course of proposing a new constitution, the state attorney general recommended adding a provision saying that both members of Congress, the House of Representatives, as well as presidential electors, would be chosen by district because there isn't actually a congressional, a, a U.S. constitutional requirement that House of Representatives members be elected by congressional districts. Many states at the time did so on an at-large basis, and this provision also said that there could be no more there would no more than two electors or no more than two representatives per district. And none other than Justice Joseph Story argued against that. He declared during the convention that such a provision within the state constitution would violate the elections clause, that a state constitution couldn't limit the discretion that the US constitution confers specifically on the state legislature. And in accordance with Justice Story's argument, the, the state convention rejected that proposal. We see the same theory articulated in uh, Cooley's constitutional limitations in re repeatedly throughout various volumes published over the course of the 1800s. Two state Supreme Court cases that, 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 that I'd like to call your attention to. The first from the Rhode Island Supreme Court in a case called In Re Plurality Elections. We saw a conflict, we saw a case involving a conflict between a state statute that said you only have to receive a plurality of the vote, meaning just more votes than any other candidate, in order to win a congressional election, versus a state constitutional provision that said in order to win any election, you have to have an absolute majority. You have to receive 50% plus one of the vote in order to win. And so, of course, we have a congressional election in which the ostensibly prevailing candidate received a plurality of the vote, but not a majority. The case goes up to the, to the state Supreme Court, and the state Supreme Court said the candidate was entitled to be seated. Typically, when we see a conflict between a state statute and the state constitution, the state constitution wins. But the state Supreme Court specifically said, because this case <coughs> involved power delegated under the US Constitution's elections clause, because the power to regulate congressional elections was coming directly from the US Constitution, the state constitution was incapable of limiting that authority, and so the state law allowing a plurality winner to be seated was enforced despite the contrary state constitutional provision. We saw a similar opinion in New Hampshire, an in re opinion of justices, where we, had a, where we had a state constitutional provision that said you have to vote in person at your precinct, and this case arose during the Civil War in order to allow, in order to allow soldiers who were deployed fighting the Civil War to vote, the state legislature passed a statute that essentially was one of the first absentee voting laws. It was a military absentee voting law that said if you were fighting, if you were away from home, unable to vote in person because you were deployed on military orders, you could cast an absentee ballot. Under the state constitution, these military ballots were impermissible. They violated the in-person voting requirement. Yet again, the state Supreme Court issued a ruling that said because we're to the extent that we're dealing with federal elections, because the power to regulate federal elections comes from the US Constitution, the state legislature could effectively trump whatever the state constitution said about this. The US Supreme Court during, during the 1800s similarly adopted this approach. In a case called McPherson v. Blacker in the, in the early 1890s, the Supreme Court held that state constitutions cannot limit state legislature's power over the selection of presidential electors, 
And we even saw an echo of this ruling as late as 2000 in the Supreme Court's unanimous opinion in Bush versus Palm Beach County Canvassing Board, where the Supreme Court reversed and remanded the Florida Supreme Court's first ruling in the Bush v. Gore litigation because it said, we're worried that rather than just interpreting state law, the Florida Supreme Court is taking into account other considerations, such as the Florida Constitution, and in general, that's fine. In general, it's not up to us as a federal court to regulate how state courts interpret state laws. But here we're dealing specifically with a presidential election. And in a presidential election, the state legislature's power is flowing from the presidential electors clause. And so we have a special obligation to ensure that the Florida Supreme Court was respecting the legislature's unique authority here by only interpreting the statute, if you will, by applying a hypertextualist view of the statute rather than also in, uh, construing it in light of the state constitution. And finally, though I won't have time to, to, to go into it during this presentation, even the chambers of Congress, the House and the Senate, in resolving election disputes under their Article I, Section 5 authority throughout the 1800s, almost always applied the independent state legislature doctrine enforcing state statutes even when they conflicted with state constitutional provisions. So from a normative perspective, why putting aside arguments for originalism, arguments about liquidation, why normatively would we want to adopt the independent state legislature doctrine? I offer four main rationales, tracing back to the constitutional debates. First, the framers said the elections clause gave state legislatures flexibility to respond to local needs and problems with regard to congressional elections. Allowing state constitutions to shackle state legislatures reduces that flexibility. Secondly, the US Constitution as a whole, pervasively of the Constitution of 1789, made political branches rather than courts ultimately responsible for federal elections. And so empowering state legislatures is consistent with that view. Third, the state legislature's authority was intended to be coextensive with Congress's authority. And so allowing the legislatures to be limited by state, by state constitutions would give them less power than Congress. And finally, simplicity and determinacy, that it was important that it be easy to know who won federal elections. And so, and so subjecting the state legislature's power to congressional restrictions would undermine that goal. And thank you for <coughs> in time. So I'm sure Lee Grove will have comments for eight minutes. All right, so thanks very much. It's always, it's always fun to, to read Michael's work. Um, it's always creative and insightful and, and makes us think about problems in new ways. And, and by the way, I'll just say off the bat, I told both Michael and Ryan that I have typed out their comments so they don't need to write anything while, while I'm speaking. Um, so they're just, they, they can just sit there and listen. Um, so this paper is, is yet another example of Michael's very creative approach to election law. Um, and it's a tremendous amount of historical research. Um, I, I don't think his presentation could give credit to how much, how much he looked at the history and how careful he is in the paper to say when history supports his views, is somewhat equivocal, and goes against his views. Um, so I, I commend you for that. So I do have an, a number of questions. Um, and one of, the, one of the points that you make in the paper, throughout the paper, that I, I think you didn't talk as much about in your presentation is this distinction between substance and procedure. So what Michael argues in the paper is that state constitutions cannot li limit the substance of what state legislatures do with respect to districting and other election law related stuff, but they can limit procedure. And I want to push against that concept because I'm not sure that really captures what you're getting at. For one thing, I think it's a little hard for us in this context to think about the difference between substance and procedure. Um, so for example, you talk about an early debate in Massachusetts where the Constitution seemed to require the legislature to draw new district lines every time there was a new congressional apportionment. Um, so one can maybe call that substance, but it strikes me as more about procedure, the timing of elections. And then I, I get to the language of Article One, Section 4, that says that state legislatures are responsible for the times, places, and manner of electing representatives and senators. Well, the terms time, place, and manner to me don't really fall into one substance or procedure box. Um, 
and so I would, I would think about a, maybe a different way of conceptualizing that that will capture what it is you're trying to capture. <laughs> the other difficulty I had was trying to figure out what it is you think is prohibited by state constitutions today. Um, clearly you think that state constitutions cannot prevent uh, or cannot prevent partisan gerrymandering by state legislatures, but I wasn't clear what else was limited today, in part because I wasn't clear under what fit into the substance box versus the procedure box. Um, is this really just a paper about partisan gerrymandering, or is it, it, or is it about fundamental limitations on what state constitutions can do vis-a-vis -vis state legislatures? And obviously the Arizona state legislature decision is a, is a tough one for you. Um, and to the extent you maintain a substance procedure distinction, um, in that case, as, as Michael was describing, the court held um, that whatever else a state constitution can do, the state constitution can actually transfer the state legislature's power to an independent districting commission. And in parts of the paper, you try to say, well, that might be OK, but let's see what else we can talk about. Uh, but to the extent that's OK, that would suggest that the state constitution could just transfer the state legislature's power to an independent district commission, in which case the substantive limitations um, with respect to partisan gerrymandering may not matter quite as much. Um, or just say, well, anything you state legislature do, it has to be approved by an independent commission, which would also sim similarly limit things. And I know you don't love the Arizona state legislature decision, uh, but one of the challenges I, I think of this paper is, do you just take it on? Um, or do you try to argue, argue, well, this is what we can do given this decision. So that's the substance procedure distinction. The second thing I wondered about was history. Um, so Michael is very forthright when he discusses what most of us would call the original history surrounding the assorted elections clauses. Um, when he's talking about convention debates or ratification debates, he says, they really don't tell us anything at all about this question and whether there is an independent state legislature doctrine. And I, and I, and I commend you for, for being forthright about that. But I think then that raises a real question. Because essentially then the paper comes down to a fight between 19th century history and a lot of 20th and 21st century history. Uh, one of the things that Michael points out in the paper is a lot of 20th and 21st century case law goes against his position. And he's very, um, very forthcoming about that. But then to me, as a matter of history, it sounds like it's an argument between a 19th century gloss on otherwise indeterminate constitutional meaning as opposed to a 20th century gloss on indeterminate constitutional meaning. Um, and I think that raises real questions for constitutional interpretation. What do we do with that? Um, is the 19th century somehow better because it's earlier? Is there something about that 19th century president, pre precedent that's better? Um, and this goes back to an earlier panel on, on stare decisis. What is the burden of proof? How, how strong does the history have to be to overturn what is a lot of recent precedent? So I think that's a, that these are all really interesting questions and there are no clear answers, but I think these are some interesting questions that are raised by the paper. Finally, to the extent that we believe that there is this independent state legislature doctrine um, and that the state constitution cannot, limit, cannot limit state legislatures in some way, I'm wondering who gets to enforce that federal constitutional requirement? And your paper doesn't really say this one way or the other. Um, one, one, one could imagine the federal judiciary doing that. Um, private parties would probably lack standing to challenge a state constitutional limitation on a lot of what state legislatures do. According to another part of the Arizona state legislature decision, the state legislature might be able to bring suit. Um, some of us might question whether that was correct. Um, and then I thought, well, well maybe it's Congress. After the other part of Article I, Section 4, after giving power over the times, places, and manner of congressional elections to state legislatures, then says Congress can completely override that if it desires. And so could Congress be in charge of deciding when state constitutions have complied with this requirement or not? Um, even with respect to, respect to presidential elections, the Constitution sets it up that Congress ultimately can rule on these things. So is this a situation where the ultimate question of the independent state legislature doctrine is actually a political question um, conferred on Congress? So just some thoughts. Okay, so some smaller, smaller 
reactions that I had to the paper. In addition to wondering about the substance procedure line or wh whether that those terms really capture what you're getting at, um, I also <coughs> wondered about your distinction between districting and voting requirements. So one of the things that Michael says in the paper is that, it, and partly to, to be consistent with a lot of case law, um, he says state legislatures have tremendous power over districting but not over voting requirements. And so you, you actually mentioned this in your talk. What about absentee ballots by members of the military? Is that about voting or about districts? Um, and it sounds like, it sounds like, in the past, the House of Representatives may have interpreted that as about the manner of elections. But I think that that raises some really interesting questions about about line drawing. Now, the final things I'll say, uh, the final thing I'll say is. Uh, you say that there hasn't been that much reliance on the Arizona State Legislature decision. Um, it was a 2015 where the court said um, state legislature in Article One, Section 4 does not just mean state legislature, it means any matter of state lawmaking, and so it's perfectly fine to transfer districting power over to independent state commissions. Um, had some standing stuff too. So it's true, it's a very recent decision, but when the Supreme Court held that partisan gerrymandering is a political question, and that's something federal courts cannot deal with at all. Um, it said, hey, this stuff can be done by state governments. So one could interpret Rucho as relying on Arizona state legislature and just the very power that you say does not exist. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm going to uh, be adjusting my remarks on the fly a little bit uh, because uh, I usually introduce this paper by spending some time explaining why I think it is important, but given that the topic of my paper, the role of originalism and the re relationship between originalism and stare decisis in the lower courts has been the topic addressed by at least two prior panels uh, today, the opening stare decisis panel and Josh Blackman's uh, uh, presentation earlier today. I'm going to invoke the ancient doctrine of res ipsa loquitur and just hope that you're all on board and, and joining me in believing that this is in fact a topic that is worthy of some consideration and discussion. Uh, just by brief way of uh, introduction and a slight bit of more evidentiary support, consider the fact that each year approximately uh, 10,000 cases are filed in the Federal Circuit Courts of Appeals versus about 80 or 90 that are resolved in a typical year by the US Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court is involved in resolving an infinitesimal fraction of all cases that are decided in the federal judiciary, and that's only the federal courts. Adding the state courts, uh, makes the disparity much more significant. So the vast bulk of constitutional cases will in fact be permanently resolved at the lower court level without any meaningful involvement by the Supreme Court itself. So given the importance of this topic, why hasn't it been discussed to date? And why apparently are so many of us becoming interested in this topic uh, at the moment? We were discussing this a bit earlier and I think Larry suggested that one possible reason is this is the first time uh, in at least modern history where we might have something like a critical mass of lower court judges who are actu uh, actually committed to or at least open to the use of originalism in their interpretive methods. To this point, most lower court decision making has been characterized by an approach that we might think of as doctrinalism, primarily looking at precedent, principally Supreme Court precedent to guide their decisions. This differs in marked fashion from the way the Supreme Court typically resolves cases. The Supreme Court typically, as most of us, many of us who uh, engage in constitutional scholarship know, employs a variety of constitutional modalities. They look at precedent, of course, but also evidence of original understanding, past practice, policy-based reasoning. These features can be glimpsed in lower court reasoning as well, but to a much lesser extent. Lower court decisions, to, by and large, focus much more centrally on doctrine as the primary input of judicial decision making. So a move toward originalism would involve something of a change in existing lower court practices. And I think this is a significant question as to what we should expect of such a change. And 
the extent to which such a change should be viewed as desirable. I think my perspective on this topic is at least a little more tempered uh, than some of the perspectives that have been offered to date. I'm not taking a position on whether this is a good or a bad development. My personal perspective is I think it would be good to see a marginally more improved uh, uh, consideration of originalism by lower court judges, but I think there are important costs to be cognizant of as well. And to appreciate those costs, it's important to keep in mind some very significant institutional differences between the Supreme Court and lower court judges, some of which have been mentioned at various points earlier today. Uh, one point we've already discussed, the significantly larger caseload faced by lower court judges. They have significantly less time to decide each case. They're also given fewer decisional resources, less access to clerks, less access to uh, uh, research and other resources, and as Josh mentioned in his presentation, less access to amicus briefing by experienced, sophisticated uh, parties who might be able to bring to them evidence of original meaning. They're also much differently situated with regard to their relationship to precedent. Unlike the Supreme Court, which is free to take a fairly loose attitude to its own prior rulings, lower courts by convention are viewed as strictly bound to adhere to prior Supreme Court precedents. And their own rulings have much less significant, uh, much less significant precedential effect. Circuit courts are limited to their own circuit court jurisdiction, uh, as are state Supreme Courts, and district courts typically do not have any precedent-making authority. So this leads to some differential consideration of the costs involved in originalism by lower court judges. As has already been mentioned today, originalism is a fairly costly <coughs> method of judicial decision making. It requires historical research, consideration of primary sources, and techniques that judges and lawyers by and large are not professionally trained to equip. And extending these resources down, these methods down to the lower court level is going to significantly increase, we should expect it to significantly increase the aggregate costs of judicial decision making in constitutional cases throughout our legal system. There's also questions of proficiency and accuracy. Our lower courts gonna do a good job of working with these materials. Now, as has been mentioned, they can rely on scholarly works and other third party research to an extent, and that might mitigate some of both these accuracy, proficiency, and cost concerns. But that raises additional concerns of how they're going to go about sorting out the various uh, scholarly claims that exist in the literature. Are they gonna do a good job of picturing, picking the right historical sources when there is a dispute among academics about what the original meaning actually requires? Another important consideration uh, in terms of costs for lower court decision making is that of uniformity. Once the Supreme Court hands down a ruling, it is binding throughout the entire nation. Lower courts, however, can lead to disuniform interpretations of federal, federal law in different uh, regional circuit jurisdictions. Okay, so those are some of the costs involved in extending originalism in a greater direction in the lower courts. What about some benefits? Well, having more minds deliberate on these topics might improve the quality of our originalist decision making. It might legitimate the aggregate decision of the Supreme Court. Having lower courts engage in originalism might spur the Supreme Court to take up questions it might have otherwise ignored. So there are real benefits on the other side as well. But to truly appreciate these benefits, we also have to have some theory of originalism and why we think originalism is a valid goal. And another part of my project is to consider the ways in which some of the most prominent arguments for originalism might affect differently when we move down from the Supreme Court into the lower court level. For example, consider the argument that we need originalism in order to support the rule of law, that we're concerned about judicial discre discretion and arbitrary uh, imposition of judicial policy preferences. Now that might be a very tangible, real concern at the Supreme Court level, given the very weak constraints that Supreme Court precedent poses on the court's own decision making. Those concerns apply with somewhat less force at the lower court level, very, given the very strong pull of ver vertical stare decisis uh, as accepted by the lower courts. Or consider, for example, the argument we heard earlier by Professor McGinnis, that originalism will le li likely lead to more desirable consequences given the supermajoritarian features through which the uh, original enactment of the Constitution was uh, undertaken. Well, for those supermajoritarian benefits to be achieved, lower courts must accurately identify what that original meaning was. And if they do a poor job of that, those benefits aren't gonna be achieved. And to the extent there is a consequentialist theory in back of that, it might be the case that the costs of moving the, direction, moving the law in a more uh, marginally originalist direction by virtue of lower court decision making might not be justified. Finally, to the extent we think that 
Judicial decisions might spur popular movements towards constitutional amendments. We might think that those arguments are much more plausible as applied to the Supreme Court, given the higher salience of its decisions, as opposed to any particular lower court decision maker. Now, as I mentioned, given these countervailing costs and benefits, I'm not coming to any strong conclusion in this article about whether or not lower courts should strive to move in a more originalist direction, but I think some tentative conclusions can be drawn. One, I think that the case for lower court originalism is going to depend to some extent, the pragmatic case at least, will depend on the disposition of the Supreme Court itself. It's much more plausible to think that the greater use of originalism by lower court judges will lead to desirable consequences if the Supreme Court is open and receptive to those arguments, if the justices themselves, or at least a majority of them, are originalist. By contrast, if we have a decidedly anti-originalist Supreme Court, then the case for lower court originalism by any particular lower court judge is somewhat weaker. Another consideration to take into account is the interpretive context in which lower court decision making is to proceed. <coughs> uh, Cases of first impression, for example, provide perhaps the strongest case for lower court originalism. By contrast, where the, Supreme, where the lower court acts against a pre-existing body of Supreme Court precedent, there are greater concerns, even if there is a technical way around those precedents or to read them more narrowly, because that enhances the problem of prospects of disuniformity at the lower court level and divergent interpretations of federal law. Finally, I think it has interp interpretive consequences for the relationship among lower courts. The argument is much stronger for circuit courts of appeals and state supreme courts than it is for district courts, uh, and perhaps somewhat stronger for federal courts as opposed to state courts. Finally, in the concluding part of the paper, I briefly consider that this is not really a problem that solely applies to originalism. It applies to a variety of non-originalist theories as well. And given my time is up, I'll just give Briefly, one example, consider the question about the use of foreign law that the Supreme Court has endorsed in a handful of recent decisions. That involves similar research costs, similar com competency concerns, and we might think that the Supreme Court will do a much better job of employing those methods than any particular lower court judge. And with that, I'll look forward to Tara's comments. Thank you so much. <clears throat> So I always enjoy reading, reading Ryan Williams' work. It's, it's excellent, and this is, this is no exception. This is a great paper. Um, he also offers a very nicely nuanced argument, um, and there, it's, it's very, very deeply, de deeply theoretical and rich. Um, and so, as with Michael, my comments are designed to, to improve upon what is already a really, really strong paper. Um, so the first big picture reaction, Ryan seems to assume that interpretive method is a, is a choice for each individual judge. Um, that, that is an assumption that I think is, is very plausible. It's actually something that I agree with. Um, but I think it's something that you should state up front, that every single justice or judge can choose his or her interpretive method. And following from that, throughout the paper, I, I wondered about whether this was a power or an obligation. So, your paper is designed to show how a lower court judge could apply originalism, but never says a lower court judge must apply originalism. Now, even if interpretive method is a matter for each individual judge, one could imagine an individual judge choosing <coughs> a form of originalism that may be seen as an obligation. And so that within the contours of Supreme Court precedent, you de definitely take that as a given, and I think that makes a lot of sense on originalist grounds. Um, within the contours of Supreme Court precedent, one could say that a lower court judge has an obligation to try to find all the gaps in the law that would allow that judge to move closer toward originalism. So, and that, re that affects a couple of, a couple of the um, smaller arguments that you make. For example, you say that when the Supreme Court in Heller seemed to adopt an originalist approach to the Second Amendment. That gave lower courts license to adopt an originalist approach to future Second Amendment cases. Well, if a lower court judge actually views originalism as an obligation, it wasn't clear to me why they had to wait for that signal from the Supreme Court that it could still, if the Supreme Court rules in, in an area and leaves a lot open for, open for the lower courts, a lower court judge could say, look, I, I, I am an originalist, I should be. And it seems to me the answer to this question really depends on what kind of originalist the lower court judge happens to be. Um, and that raises a related question. Well, what if the lower court judge adopts a positivist 
version of originalism or a positive, positivist approach to constitutional interpretation. Uh, well, that seems to raise all sorts of different questions for lower court judges because the practice in the lower courts has largely been one based on Supreme Court precedent rather than lower court judges doing their own thing with interpretive theory. So is it possible that a positivist approach to originalism would not only not require but actually foreclose some of what you're saying? Um, now, my third big point is about the end of your paper, which you, you, you mentioned briefly. Um, as you say that a lot of your arguments could potentially apply to lower court judges adopting different interpretive methods. Um, and I guess my question for you is, what do you want the scope of this paper to be? If you, want to be? if you want it to be about lower court originalism, then my recommendation would be to save the end of that paper for a separate paper on lower court constitutional interpretation or lower court use of other interpretive methods. Um, and it really goes to the question, of, does originalism raise distinct questions? for the lower federal courts, <coughs> questions that are not raised by common law constitutionalism or theorism or some other method. Um, it seems to me that you wrote this paper because you think the answer to that is yes. And if the, if the answer to that is yes, then it seems to me that you may need two other papers um, rather than a single paper. So those are the big picture comments. So some smaller comments. Um, and this, this goes back to, to the, the Heller example. Throughout most of the paper, Ryan adopts a hierarchical model of precedent. That is, the Supreme Court speaks, lower courts follow. Um, and I know just looking around the room, there's several other people who agree with, with that approach, um, as, as do I. But there's one part of the paper where you seem to move over to a predictive approach to lower, the lower court's relationship with the Supreme Court. That's when you say this, the lower court should move more towards originalism if they predict that's what the Supreme Court is going to do. Um, and I just wondered why, why lower courts are you have sort of a mandatory hierarchical approach with respect to much, a lot of things, but a more predictive approach when it comes to interpretive theory. Second small point, um, you say that it would be much easier in terms of decision costs for, for lower courts to adopt theorism, that is be very deferential to federal and state legislatures and agency regulations. Um, and it's not clear to me why that would at all be the case. Now theoretically, if from the beginning lower courts just, and, and courts in general, just um, said yes to whatever, whatever democratic or political bodies did, that, that would be easier. Um, but that would be very hard for a lower court to do today because much of Supreme Court doctrine is very much at odds with theorism. Um, so it seems to me that that approach could be quite complicated for a lower court judge as well. And the final small point I'll make, and that relates to the end of your comments, um, foreign law, you put in that lower courts have, have to struggle with the consideration of foreign law. Um, and that struck me as a bit out of place in this paper. Um, I, don't, I don't think there's an, an, foreign law is an interpretive method. Um, for some people, it's a source of interpretation, but I, I would not call consideration of a foreign law as equivalent to originalism or constitutional law, common law constitutionalism or theorism. Um, so that struck me as a little out of place here, although an important subject in and of itself. Um, but I want to end my comments on, on both papers by saying that these really are excellent papers, and I, I commend both of them to you. Um, and I know when, whenever we're doing commentary like this, sometimes it can be a little jolting to the, the author because you're hearing all of these suggestions. And, oh, man, I really screwed up. No, 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 that's not at all what we're doing here. Um, these papers were selected because they are all really, really good papers. And our goal is to make them better. And unfortunately, that means we, say, we, we offer more constructive criticism than the praise that the papers deserve. <laughs> and I'll stop there. So, um, we have uh, 10 <coughs> minutes for uh, yeah. uh, questions uh, and comments from the audience. Okay. Do we want to do this now or save this to the end? Uh, the saying? schedule is to okay. do it now. Okay. Next paper is now, then the other ones at the end. That's a plan. Yes, John. Uh, I have a mic here. Uh, so this is to Ryan Williams. Uh, so I wondered whether that you deal, uh, I've read the paper, with what I would consider kind of chicken and egg problem, which is that, well, of course, uh, people don't offer originalist arguments to court, lower courts now because they don't look at them much now. But if they started looking at them, they would. Indeed, we'd see scholars, uh, as they do now at the Supreme Court. We're delighted to uh, offer them. Uh, so, uh, and that goes to, I think, a more general question, which is how central a, a culture of originalism is to the promotion of originalism. And so if you think, and this goes way back to 
what some people thought of uh, judges. They were also kind of Republican schoolmasters. Uh, that's a role for them. And so that strikes me as, as a big benefit, which you're not putting into the calculus. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I think uh, it is, I think, you know, we, we can think of this almost as a, you know, a we could distinguish between transition costs versus uh, kind of upkeep costs. And I think both will likely be higher. That's my intuition on the long term. Perhaps not once the Supreme Court moves in a more originalist direction, then uh, the precedents might be easier to apply, might require less uh, original work. But I think the upfront costs of moving in a more originalist direction, I think, are uh, likely to be fairly significant, at least in the near term. So I think that is uh, another important kind of contextual factor to think about as a, you know, we, we can think of this as both a systemic, systemic question and a question for the individual judge. You know, should I be more originalist? And I think the strength of the argument for that, at least if we're thinking about it in a consequentialist kind of way, is really going to depend in part on the uh, predictive uh, view of what the Supreme Court's going to do on the one hand, and also what the cohorts and the other uh, courts are going to do. If the prediction is that the Supreme Court is not going to take this information into account, the other courts aren't going to follow suit, then the costs are fairly high for relatively little, at least short-term benefit. If the prediction is that other judges are going to follow suit, we're going to get in a near-term or foreseeable-term uh, uh, stance a, a more widespread embrace, then those costs might be uh, more justified. Can I just say one more point on this? If it's very short. <laughs> the question, though, is, is a culture, in other words, that it does not depend wholly on the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is a follower of culture as well as a creator of law. I, I agree with that. Steve. So, uh, to begin with, uh, my apologies for missing lunch. I thought I was supposed to be uh, moderating a panel at lunch tomorrow instead of today. <laughs> so I'm extremely sorry about that. Uh, I came in in the middle of Michael and Ryan's presentations and heard Tara's presentations. And I guess I have the following question about redistricting, which is that um, when the Warren Court imposed the one person, one vote principle on the states, uh, it essentially required the states to stop following county and municipal boundary lines in drawing districts. And all that mattered was that every district be as nearly equal as possible in population. And you could draw all kinds of squiggly districts so long as they were as nearly equal in population as possible. As late as 1929, federal law under Article 4 required that U.S. congressional districts be as nearly equal in population as possible and as compact as possible. For some reason that I've never under gotten to the bottom of, the compactness requirement was deleted from federal law in 1929. But uh, it seems to me that if we are to adhere rigidly to the one person, one vote principles without adding some sort of compactness principle, we are not really respecting the original understanding of the Constitution. We have districts that are very Democratic and very Republican. And so contrary to Rucho, uh, it seems to me that we have to either abandon one person, one vote, or more likely add some sort of compactness requirement Otherwise, we're not really being faithful to the original understanding with respect to redistricting. So I wondered if you had any comments on the tension between adhering to one person, one vote as a sacrosanct principle with the consequence that it leads to gerrymandered districts. So that's a complicated question. Just to, to briefly touch on some of the highlights, the first thing is, there was, I, would, I would suggest there wasn't an original intent with regard to congressional redistricting precisely because it wasn't, it wasn't mandated by the Constitution. The Constitution allows states to award all of their House of Representatives seats on a winner-take-all basis if they, if they wish to, exactly, on, on an at-large basis. The, uh, obviously, right, the term gerrymandering itself traces back to the founding era precisely because the founders were engaged in gerrymandering for their own political advantage. So a, a, a prohibition on on gerrymandering, whether you want to call it political gerrymandering, non-compactness in districts, 
I don't find an originalist argument supporting, su su supporting such restrictions to the extent that as a policy matter, it would, be, it would be desirable to have a compactness requirement. Congress, in exercising its authority under the Elections Clause, is able to reinstate such a requirement as a matter of statute. In fact, it was Congress in the 1800s that originally required as a matter of statute that, that, sta that all states engage in congressional districting at all. State legislatures are free to, uh, to adopt such requirements as a matter of statute. Simply, the state, to the extent that state constitutions have compactness requirements, those are simply unenforceable, in my view, uh, with regard to, to congressional elections under the independent state legislature doctrine. So, Ryan Williams, how would you respond to Josh, Josh Blackman's idea that the role of originalism in lower courts would simply be to, to not extend a precedent that runs contrary to the original meaning of the Constitution? Yeah, I think that's a, I think there's an important kind of uh, exception. We could think of, you know, there's kind of a spectrum. We could think of outright defiance on the one hand. We could think of what Richard Ray has characterized as narrowing. So not necessarily the best reading of the Supreme Court's decision, but one that's technically possible. You can sort of make a clever argument to make it consistent. And then to go even further, outright extending the principle of the original decision to a new factual context. Uh, so I think... I'm more comfortable with originalism as a counterweight to the overt extension because that's a context in which lower courts are likely to go in different directions no matter what. I'm a little more skeptical, a little more hesitant with regard to something like narrowing and certainly outright defiance because that does open up that uh, prospect of disuniformity and other adverse uh, 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 consequences. I think when you are in a situation where you have an actual gap, there is going to be some need to fill it with some prospect. Now you could choose a low cost decision strategy like just relying on Supreme Court dicta or looking at what other lower courts have said, or you could put in the time and effort to actually try to figure out what the original meaning actually requires. And I think that there, uh, again, depending on what the background context is, I think there are arguments for putting in that effort or having lower courts engaging in that process. So Ryan, um, <clears throat> We have an adversary system, so yes. uh, uh, <clears throat> which has consequences for mm -hmm. your uh, for your paper, and in particular, I, and of course, if the parties haven't raised originalist arguments, that's a different context. But right. um, I just would like to ask you to address the situation in which uh, a party has raised the originalist argument, and the judge believes. Mm -hmm that they have a duty of political morality to honor the original meaning of the constitutional text um, uh, uh, if there mm -hmm. is no controlling Supreme Court precedent. Are you, are you saying that in those circumstances, the pragmatic costs uh, should justify judges in violating what they believe is their duty of political morality? Right, so I think in the, you know, in, the, in the adversary context, I think you know, there is a presumptive duty on the part of judges to uh, address in some fashion any argument that's presented by uh, the council or, or, or by the parties appearing before them. So if there is a originalist argument offered by one side that is conceded by the other side and there's no countervailing argument offered by the opposing party or if the opposing party offers a argument grounded in a theory of constitutional interpretation that the judge believes is incorrect or inconsistent with their view of political morality, then I think that it's entirely appropriate for the judge to uh, favor the party uh, who has asserted the originalist argument. Now, the judge might have options in terms of how they explain and justify their decision, depending on how confident they are of the validity of the historical representations being made to them by the party. I think they could qualify their ruling in some fashion, uh, making clear that this party wins, but they're now foreclosing the possibility that a different argument, either grounded in originalism or in some other modality, might uh, persuade them in a future case. Or uh, if they're the more likely situation is the party, opposing party will offer some other argument. Either they might contest the argument on originalist grounds or they might point to a countervailing line of Supreme Court authority. It's going to depend on, again, this is a spectrum question, how clearly does the Supreme Court precedent speak to the question on the one hand versus how clearly does the originalist research uh, point to the question on the other. And 
what level of effort we should expect or demand lower court judges to put in uh, to resolving that question when there is some meaningful level of uncertainty as to what the original meaning actually requires. And that brings the first part of the program to a conclusion. And Tara, do you want to switch places or are you going to stay there? I'm happy staying there. Okay, very would... good. So Tara is taking it <coughs> now as moderator. Yes. Um, all right, so now we're going to move over, move over to Christian Brissett to present your paper. All right. Uh, so thank you all for being here, and thank you to the Federal Society for organizing this. Uh, any good talk on the rule of law has to begin by admitting that no one can agree what the term means. Uh, it is what some scholars have called an essentially contested or essentially contestable concept. And I wanted to figure out why that was. Uh, because when I talked to historians who write about the rule of law, they were very comfortable talking about a great deal of consensus in the past. They'd write articles saying things like the idea of the rule of law in the 17th century. So how do we go from consensus to contestation? And my paper proposes an answer to that. Uh, which is that this, this changes sometime in the 18th century, uh, in part as a result of debates about how to govern an increasingly diverse British empire. Uh, I will say that in the interest of time, I'm not going to be able to show uh, much of my evidence, but I, I am happy to send my paper to those who want it. Uh, what I'll do today is just three things. First, I'll sketch out two different conceptions of the rule of law that developed during the 18th century. I'll then explain how questions of empire ended up shaping these conceptions, how they ended up uh, changing how they interacted. Uh, and then I'll briefly talk about why you should care about any of this. Uh, so these two conceptions. The first, the older one, what the paper calls the traditional conception of the rule of law, uh, developed in the 17th century. And it had three key characteristics. Uh, it was institutionally specific, aversive, and thick. So the first characteristic meant that instead of defining the rule of law by reference to uh, things like general principles, like clarity and generality, the way we tend to do it today, the traditional rule of law looked to paradigm English institutions, things like trial by jury, the writ of habeas corpus, and freehold land tenures. Second, it was aversive. So just as there are paradigmatically good institutions, there are paradigmatically bad ones, like the Spanish Inquisition. So to figure out if a particular practice uh, comported with the rule of law, one would hold up the spectrum from the inquisition to the trial by jury and see where the particular practice fit along that spectrum. Um, and then finally, it was what theorists today would call a thick conception of the rule of law. The rule of law meant the rule of good laws. It aimed to achieve a particular vision of English liberty. Starting around the middle of the 18th century, a second conception emerged. Uh, I call it the modern conception. And this one was abstract, cosmopolitan, and thin. So unlike the traditional view, which looked to institutions, the modern view did use abstract principles, especially the requirement of legal certainty, the idea that people have to be able to plan their lives around the law. It was cosmopolitan in that this requirement of certainty could apply to any legal system anywhere. It was much less Anglo-centric than, than the traditional view was. And finally, it was thin. It tried to divorce the question of what good law was from the law of supremacy. Now, in practice, these two conceptions coexisted pretty well. Right? There was no legal academy. People were not writing law review articles trying to distinguish them. Uh, what really forced them apart, what forced people to think about them as different conceptions, was the question of how to rule the British Empire, and particularly the question of what law would govern Britain's colonies. Uh, around the middle of the 18th century, Britain acquired a bunch of new colonies. Uh, most prominently Quebec and Bengal. These had large non-English populations accustomed to being ruled by non-English legal systems. And Britain had to decide whether or not to apply English law to these places or not. Uh, There's a debate over this. Uh, those politicians who favored imposing English law tended to evoke the traditional conception. Right? If we measure the rule of law by looking to English institutions, then it seems pretty clear that to have the rule of law in colonies, one has to apply English law. Those who favored withholding English law from the colonies tended to go for the modern conception, both because it gave them flexibility. This was a more cosmopolitan theory, um, but also because of its requirement of legal certainty. Right? If the chief goal of the rule of law is to make sure people can plan their lives around the law, the argument went, then what could be more destructive of that than bringing in an entirely new legal system from overseas? Uh, for reasons I explain elsewhere, the proponents of withholding English law won. Right, the people who wanted to keep pre-existing legal systems in place won. And that had consequences for the rule of law tradition. Once Britain embraced a policy of having different laws in different places, 
British commentators had to go for the modern conception. Otherwise, they would risk critiquing the very foundations of the British Empire. They would say, in essence, the British Empire was ruling its colonies lawlessly, and most commentators were unwilling to do that. And that, the paper argues, has left a permanent mark on how we talk about the rule of law today. Even now, um, the idea of legal certainty is central to pretty much every conception of the rule of law. The question is, what else do you have to add on top of that? OK, so why should we care about this? The paper gives a few reasons. I'll focus just on one in the interest of time. And then it tells us something new about how the way we talk about the rule of law changes and why it changes. Uh, there's been a lot of good work on the rule of law and empire, but it tends to, to fall into one of two camps. The first camp you might call the neocon camp, uh, which is that empires are great for the rule of law because they bring order to places that lacked it. Uh, the other camp, more common in the academy, is the, you might call it the post-colonial camp, uh, which is that empires are terrible for the rule of law uh, because the rule of law always dies in colonial settings. What these two camps have in common is an assumption that the rule of law is a sort of a static thing that did not change as a result of imperial governance. Right? Either, uh, say, places like London developed a rule of law that they exported to Africa and Asia, or they developed a rule of law that then died along the way. But in neither version does the rule of law itself as an ideal change. My paper suggests that actually the experience of governing an empire changed what the ideal of the rule of law was. It changed how, what people meant when they invoked the rule of law. And that, I think, is a broader lesson for us, uh, even for those of you who don't care about empire intrinsically, which is a mistake. Uh, and it suggests that, that the rule of law changes content not just because of the work of, of great theorists, but because of how it's invoked in everyday political discourse, how it's invoked in solving uh, everyday political contingencies and policy debates. And that, I think, might be a useful thing to keep in mind uh, as we invoke the rule of law today in contemporary discussions. Thank you. Very nice and under time. Um, all right, Larry Solom will have comments. <coughs> uh, thank you. Well, wonderful paper. I learned a lot from your paper. Uh, as I've learned from many of your papers, uh, and uh, I, of course, I'm going to focus on uh, an area where I see problems with the paper. So um, the paper is framed. I, I'm going to stand up because I'm blocked uh, by the podium from, from half the room. Uh, the paper starts out with a theoretical device, uh, which is uh, the concept conception distinction. So the paper argues that there are two conceptions of the rule of law. Uh, and uh, the rule of law is a single concept. And then that we can understand the historical origins of uh, the two conceptions uh, with reference to uh, British imperial experience. So th I believe that this uh, thesis uh, cannot be true. Uh, it misunderstands at a fundamental level the way in which the concept conception distinction works in legal theory. So the concept conception distinction uh, is based on the idea that some concepts uh, have a peculiar uh, property that people agree that they're talking about the same concept, even when the criteria for the application of the concept uh, are completely different, given two different theories. So the classic example of the way this plays out in theory that's led to legal theory would be the word good. A uh, utilitarian believes the good is one thing. Uh, Bentham believed that it's the maximization of pleasure and the minimization of pain. Kant thinks that it's something entirely different and that pain and pleasure have nothing to do with good. Now it looks like they're talking about two different concepts, right? Because they have different theories of the structure of the concept. Galley, a British philosopher, introduced the idea of essentially contested concepts to reclaim the idea that there's a real disagreement here about the nature of the good, two different conceptions of the same concept. 
But not all uses of the same terminology associated with different criteria for application involve the concept conception distinction. So in order to make out that we have two different conceptions of the same concept, you have to give an account of the nature of the underlying concept and show that the two different accounts are actually accounts of that same concept. But as I, as I read the paper, I think the <coughs> paper is describing something entirely different than that. The paper is describing linguistic drift. So we have two radically different concepts here. The earlier concept is a concept about what kind of normative legal order is desirable. This is the thick concept that a normatively desirable legal order has certain substantive content. And we use the word, the rule of law, the phrase, the term, the rule of law, uh, uh, as the name for that concept. The later discussion, the, the so-called modern conception, is a different concept. It is the concept that there is an independent value associated with the features that we now identify with the rule of law, the generality of law, certainty of law, and so on. There are different lists of what characteristics are required for a legal regime to instantiate the value of the rule of law. So what the paper is actually describing is the following metalinguistic contestation or metalinguistic negotiation regarding the use of the term rule of law. So in the early period, we have this phrase, rule of law. It's associated with these good things. We have a concept that rule of law, that means jury trials, that means uh, property rights and so on and so forth, a whole bundle of particular legal requirements. And these legal requirements now are not instantiated in a new context, and in particular in the new context of governance of colonial territories where the colonizer has chosen not to impose that set of substantive legal requirements in the new context. So we want, of course, to preserve the rhetoric of the rule of law, but the old concept of the rule of law won't work. And so we begin to negotiate a new meaning for the phrase rule of law. Now, um, this means then that the frame of the paper the frame, this is just the first few paragraphs, right? The frame of the paper doesn't describe what the pa paper actually does. What the paper actually does is describe a situation in which a metalinguistic negotiation takes place over time and then the reasons why this metalinguistic negotiation took place. Like Tara, I have a couple of minor points. So it, it seems to me that uh, a couple of additional things that the paper might address are the following. One, during the same period where there is this evolution regarding the use of the phrase rule of law, there's another major conceptual revolution that goes on and that is that we begin to develop a new concept of what law is. So we have a transition from a sort of uh, natural law account. It has various instantiations. The Blackstone, I just used the Blackstonian one as an example, to a positivist account. And much of the particular historical detail in the paper implicates this change, the change from a normative monoculture 
with deep consensus on values and legal rules to the emergence of legal pluralism uh, and moral pluralism. <coughs> and this is particularly acute in the colonial context where you have two different value systems and two different systems of legal norms competing with each other. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we are now, we are now moving on to Mihailis. So. Thank you. Um, so Christian thinks a good legal discussion starts with uh, some definitions of terms. I think a good legal discussion starts with a hypo. <laughs> so here it is. Um, Marvin <laughs> makes investments on behalf of Cybank, trying to maximize returns. And like all decent investment bankers, Marvin only purchases or sells positions after methodically collecting and weighing information about future performance. One day, Marvin acquires non-public information that Big Co. is going to make a bid to acquire Small Co. Marvin's models predict that Small Co.'s stock price will shoot up after Big Co. announces its plans, and consequently, Marvin invests in Small Co. and makes a killing for Cybank. Now, if you're a student in my corporate crimes class, your bells are going off. You think, oh, well, here's Cybank. I've got a corporation, and it looks like they might have engaged in insider trading through Marvin. And if Marvin is a human employee of Cybank, you know how the analysis goes. You want to know what, figure out what Marvin knew. Did Marvin know the inside information? What did Marvin know about the provenance of the information? And then from there, you can start ticking off your boxes because you attribute that knowledge to Cybank. Now, if Marvin instead is one of these ubiquitous algorithmic trading pro platforms that banks and hedge funds are using, well, the liability inquiry automatically aborts. Why? Because you need to have knowledge of inside information to get inside trading, and algorithms don't know things. They're not people. I call this, this contrast, this with this, uh, that Marvin illustrates, the problem of algorithmic corporate misconduct. I want to describe why I think it's a problem for corporate criminal law, and why I think with just some modest conceptual innovation, we might have the framework already implicit in corporate criminal law to address the problem of algorithmic corporate misconduct. So one thing that's clear is that the bots are taking over business. They're replacing human employees. Amazon has bots that are packing our boxes. Banks have bots that are approving and declining loan applications. Hedge funds have algorithms, bots that are executing trades. There are even algorithms that are sitting as members of corporate boards. And this replacement of human function by automation is only going to increase exponentially over the next decade. Algorithms are cheaper than we are. They're faster than we are. They can, in the right circumstances, perform better and more objectively than we can. But one thing that's clear is that even though algorithms are cheaper, faster, and potentially more objective and effective than we are, is that they're still going to engage in certain kinds of misconduct. So computer scientists have shown uh, that algorithms can, and in fact today are, committing things that look like criminal misconduct. Algorithms that set prices for retailers are colluding with each other to set super competitive prices. Um, algorithms are manipulating stock. They're engaging in high volume trading to churn, on, to churn stock and inflate prices. Um, and so I think this presents now a, a legal problem for corporate criminal law. Now, the source of the legal problem, or one of the sources of the legal problem, is that most criminal liability, corporate criminal liability, requires some kind of mental state. Typically, that mental state is something like knowledge. You have to know about the inside information to be guilty of insider trading. You have to know that the information on the claims that you're submitting to the federal government is false to be guilty of false claims. You have to know about the tax laws you're evading in order to be guilty of tax evasion. The doctrine we have for attributing mental states like knowledge to corporations is respond yet superior. And in the ordinary traditional context where employees are acting on behalf of corporations, we know exactly how respond yet superior works. You've got to find the employee. You've got to ask if the employee was operating in the scope of their employment, 
Ask if the employee was intending to benefit the corporation, and if so, then all the stuff that's in the employee's head you can attribute to the corporation. But when we have algorithms acting instead of employees, none of those boxes get ticked because algorithms aren't employees, so they have no scope of their employment, and they don't have mental states, so they never intend to benefit their employers, and even if they did, they don't have any knowledge that we could attribute. So respondent superior sets up this problem where when corporations are engaging in conduct through their algorithms, it's difficult to hold them liable because we need to have the mental state, and without the employer, we don't have the mental state to attribute. Now, it's worrisome in criminal law. Um, this is a, a, an example of a broader problem about algorithms engaging in misconduct and injuring people, but it's particularized to the corporate case where I think it's, um, where I think it's pressing because corporations are developing the most sophisticated algorithms, the ones with the furthest reach that are having the broadest social impacts. Now, if I'm right that respondent superior just doesn't apply to algorithmic corporate misconduct, then corporations, by swapping the function from a human being to an employee, effectively get themselves a get out of jail for free card. If the algorithm is doing it and they can't have a mental state through the algorithm, they can never satisfy the mens rea element of the underlying crime. So they've effectively immunized themselves from criminal liability for misconduct on behalf that the algorithm might carry out. And if corporations have an opportunity to hedge their liability, they're going to take it, and they are taking it. By transferring functions from employees to algorithms, and corporations reduce their risks. And if they can reduce their risk, we should expect that corporations will do it in a way perhaps even before the algorithms are sufficiently developed for socially responsible use. So this is a problem which accelerates and feeds itself, right? We get more algorithms, but the algorithms are themselves the problem. And in the corporate context, I think the problem is particularly pressing. If you have an employee engaging on misconduct on behalf of a corporation, and for some reason you can't sue the corporation, the victim has another recourse. They can just sue the employee. When it's an algorithm doing it, the corporation is the only game in town, the only potential defendant, because you can't sue an algorithm. Now, solving this problem of algorithmic corporate misconduct is not a simple matter of just applying respondeat superior more intelligently. It's true that there are employees of the corporations who are developing the algorithms that the corporations are using. So we do have an employee hand involved somewhere. But as I said, most of these criminal statutes require something like knowledge or intent. And in the typical case, the developer, the software developer, is not going to know that the algorithm will then go on to engage in some kind of misconduct, or it certainly won't intend for the algorithm to go on to engage in some kind of misconduct. And it's not an answer to try to resort to negligence or recklessness principles. The most sophisticated algorithms we have now are designed using machine learning and artificial intelligence. They build in a certain level of unpredictability. That's part of why they're so powerful. They're unconstrained by the limits of human intelligence. They solve problems in ways that we couldn't anticipate. This is what makes them faster and better than we are, but it also opens up a space that sometimes the algorithms are going to end up doing things that look really bad. And the algorithms can end up doing this even if all the developers who are involved in designing and training the algorithm are behaving perfectly reasonably. So the solution I developed draws on some themes from the philosophy of mind. It's called extended mind theory, and I don't really want to get into it. Um, I want to just kind of focus on the application. So I'll describe the corporate application in a kind of high level of detail. The general gist is that I want to leverage this kind of quirky aspect of corporate criminal law that we have already, which is that corporations are people and corporations have minds, and those minds are situated in the brains of their employees. Now, by using extended mind theory, philosophy gives us a framework for thinking about how to extend the corporate mind past its traditional repository and to other mechanisms, other features of corporations that are performing similar roles to the employees themselves, the traditional house of the corporate mind. The basic idea is that when algorithms do things that employees would otherwise be doing, there's the possibility that the corporate mind extends to the algorithms as well. The basic inquiry that I set up is comparative. You have an, an algorithm, a corporation engaging in misconduct through an algorithm. You want to know if that corporation instantiates 
the mens rea, you compare it to a corporation that engaged in the same pattern of behavior but using human employees. And the likelihood that the corporation instantiated the mental state through the algorithm increases in direct proportion to the likelihood that a corporation using an employee rather than an algorithm also had that mental state. I just want to name a couple quick benefits of the account before my time runs out. So there are other ways that you could solve this problem. Uh, you could propose something more radical, like we'll just make incorporations strictly liable in criminal law for all the injuries their algorithms commit, or declaring that algorithms are people and so we can just treat them like uh, employees, they have mental states. Um, the route that I propose has, I think, some benefits over those. So the first is just that it, it starts solving the problem. It now gives us a conceptual framework for thinking about corporate culpability even when it's algorithms rather than employees who are acting. The second is that it establishes a parity between corporations who are using employees and corporations who are using algorithms to carry out the same sorts of functions so we don't incentivize corporations to rush to automate. Third benefit, we don't have, it's not a strict liability sort of proposal, so we still preserve a space for innovation that I think we need um, in the corporate digital context. And finally, and most importantly, um, the proposal, I think it's, it's implementable today. It just requires stepping into the corporate <coughs> fiction that we already have, seeing how that fiction can extend beyond its traditional house and move into the algorithms that are driving today and tomorrow. Thank you. John Griffith. Okay. <clears throat> I, have, um, I have slides, I'm afraid. I, I, um, I can't yell at my kids without slides. <laughs> so uh, I made slides. So, yell at? Yeah, well, I would never <laughs> yell at my kids. So um, Mihalis' paper is really interesting, and I learned an enormous amount from it. Um, and so it was a real, a pl real pleasure to read it, and it's real exciting to comment on it. Um, Mihalis' paper uh, basically applies to corporate law um, a theory of knowledge that uh, he <coughs> refers to as extended mind. The gist of which is that uh, is to treat as knowledge uh, not only the processes going on in our brains, but also the information available to us. Um, and so uh, I'll describe it in greater detail in a minute, but that sort of just struck me as recognition in theory of a phenomenon that others have observed in our culture, which is our machines becoming extensions of us or uh, 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 us becoming extensions of our machines. In my comments, I'm going to try to do uh, four things. I'm going to try to suggest that Mihalis should ground the speculative in the concrete a bit more. Um, I'm going to ask, since it's a paper that raises philosophical questions, what would Socrates say? Um, <laughs> I'm going to try to figure out what the cash out is in terms of who has the whip hand in prosecutions. And I'm going to talk a bit about knowledge uh, in the, in, the, in the corporate law context when we basically have a mind, a corporate a corporation is not a thing, of course, but a mindless nexus of contracts. So first sort of uh, uh, nitpicky things. Um, Mihalis gives a lot of sort of examples of things that could happen or out ways in which, you know, like algorithms gone r bad or something like a, um, but, um, but I, I, you know, I want to know if there's ever been a time when a, a case has come down uh, where the defense was raised that the algorithm did it. Um, because it strikes me that uh, you know, that would be useful. Uh, and, and it seems to me that that's not just sort of a, it seems to me that the dynamics of corporate prosecution would suggest that that would not occur for the following reason. Um, lots of cases that have intent, lots of crimes which have intent requirements have like fellow traveler wrongdoing that doesn't require intent. So an example I'm familiar with is the FCPA, right? To prove that a corporation bribed some foreign official, you have to show corrupt intent, which is hard. But you also get to show, which when corporations bribe someone, they also always falsify their books. And falsifying their books does not require intent. So prosecutors are able to bring two things. They're able to bring the, uh, the uh, intent element and then the non-intent element. And because of, um, the dynamics of corporate prosecution are so terrible from a corporation's perspective with the prospect of potential debarment, uh, these things always settle. They settle in deferred prosecution agreements and non-prosecution agreements. So it seems to me that you don't get a lot of going to the, going to the mat uh, in corporate prosecutions. And so you don't get a lot of, uh, this, uh, this seems to me is the kind of thing that might not ever come up. Um, the other thing I'll say is that the, the extended mind theory would be, uh, seems to be presented as a judicially created or judicially creatable 
option. Um, um, but it gives something to the, prosecute, the prosecutors, but the prosecutors already have the whip hand in these prosecutions for the reasons that I just said. So if algorithmic crime is a problem, it seems like it would be a problem in specific types of situations. So because it would come up in specific types of situations, why not just let the legislature write the statute in a different way that would deal with knowledge and avoid the potential sweeping consequences of a big theory? Okay. What would Socrates say? Um, so the extended mind theory relies on a functionalist theory of knowledge, which basically says that it would, it treats knowledge as any mental state which is connected with an output, regardless of how they're connected. So Michalis's paper points out they could be connected by neurons, by gears, or by um, programming. And regardless of where they're connected, so they could be connected in the skull or out in, in the world in some way. And Michalis's paper gives a hypo involving two people, Alice and Barry, who, um, who are trying to get somewhere. And the one of them, uh, uh, Alice, memorizes the directions for how to get there. And Barry has no memory at all and writes them out and consults the writing constantly. And the point is that according to extended mind theory, these are indistinguishable because both of them involve information uh, uh, and the process is kind of internal, kind of external, but they are, uh, that's the information. And so what would Socrates say? And I think he would say, not so fast. Uh, there are other ways to conceive of knowledge. In fact, Socrates did address this uh, in the Phaedrus. So what does he say? He says, you know, Phaedrus, um, that, that is the strange thing about writing, which makes it truly correspond to painting. The painter's products stand out before us as though they were alive, but if you question them, they maintain a majestic silence. It's the same with the written word. Uh, they seem to talk to you as though they were intelligent, but if you ask them anything about what they say, they just go on telling the same thing forever. So what's Socrates doing there? He's distinguishing knowledge from information. And he's saying that the information is the painting, it's the words, they're not open to inquiry, they're just there. Uh, but what knowledge is, is something other than that. Uh, it's a process. It, it basically is the process where we interrogate the knowledge or we explain it in some way, explain the information rather, uh, explain it in some way. Now, that definition of knowledge, it makes it easier to distinguish between Alice and Barry in the hypothetical because Alice, uh, or, or uh, th that changes the hypothetical. It's a different way of understanding. Basically, knowledge would become an inf in be knowledge becomes information plus an ability to interrogate it. And in the extended mind theory, it seems to elide the distinction between knowledge and information. Now, you might say, well, who cares what Socrates says about knowledge and information? But I would say, well, this, it, the distinction between knowledge and information turns into an important distinction because our ability to interrogate information <coughs> is precisely the function that knowledge serves in the law. Now, Mihala said that a good paper has lots of hypos. His has two good hypos. It was the, that's the insider trader one that he starts out with. But the real operative hypo is this one involving um, a health company where an algorithm basically fills out the form, okay? Now, the important part is the highlighted part because what, what happens is the algorithm learns somehow by machine learning, and this I don't understand, but Mahalis does, that, that it, could, it could learn to commit fraud. So the programmers did not intend it, and the algorithm does the wrongdoing all by itself. So this is the hard case. It's the case where there's no human being with intent or knowledge in the company. And this is the case that Mahalis' theory is intended to deal with. Oh my goodness. How does it work? Well, the extended mind theory would basically catch this violation the very first time. Um, but traditional doctrines of knowledge would work differently. They would say, look, once the violation occurs, you know that it happened and you can prevent it and so you, then you have knowledge. Or they might say, you programmed the, uh, the algorithm and you ought to have known. That's an important distinction because the second way, the current traditional doctrine of knowledge allows some slippage, some crime occurs, some wrongdoing occurs, but innovation also <coughs> occurs and the costs of compliance aren't super high. So here's Mitt losing the election. He says, corporations are people too, my friend, and the guy in the crowd says, no, they're not, and the guy in the crowd is right, right? Corporations are not people, they don't have minds, but knowledge has a function inside the corporation. What it does is it sets limits on costly precautions. It does it in contract, so in contract, you know, your, your merger agreement, for example, would have a knowledge qualifier that would limit the amount of inquiry that, um, that you would have to do uh, in, in connection with due diligence. Um, 
but that's what criminal law does too. That's what criminal law's use of knowledge is doing. It's limiting the amount that the firm has to invest in precaution. The extended mind theory erases the knowledge qualifier, or at least changes it a lot, by treating knowledge as any kind of information that the corporation has access to. That means that the, the cost of precautions go way up, much closer to the kind of strict liability regime that Mihalis was saying is extremely costly, and I would just add, also harmful to innovation. Thanks. Alan is going to is going to finish us off. Thanks. So, is this working? No. It is working. Yeah. Uh, th there we go. Uh, thanks so much, and uh, sorry for my tardiness. And I'd also like to thank uh, Phil Pamberger. I understand he's parachuted in uh, to do the commentary uh, for my paper. So I look very much look forward to hearing what he has to say. Uh, my paper is called In Search of Prerogative, and it's about the meaning of the phrase, the executive power, in the vesting clause of Article 2. There are currently two competing approaches to understanding the grant of the executive power to the president as a substantive grant of power. The prevailing view among formalists and originalists is that the executive power refers to all royal powers and authorities possessed by the British monarch circa 1787 and any other power that is executive in its nature, subject, of course, to the assignment of such powers to different departments of the national government and the Constitution. So, uh, for example, Congress actually gets most of the historic royal prerogative authorities from declaring war, regulating fleets and armies, issuing letters of mark and reprisals, to regulating commerce and coining money. The Senate, as you know, gets a share of the treaty and appointment powers, but any residual royal authority or power executive in nature, such as a foreign affairs power, otherwise belongs to the president. So that's view one. Uh, Julian Mortensen, in two recent papers, and John Harrison uh, in another, claim, on the other hand, that the executive power is not a residual grant of royal authorities, as, and is instead a grant of a single power. It is the power to execute law. Nothing more, nothing less. The executive power on this understanding was a subset of the royal prerogatives, the suite of authorities possessed by the British monarch. On this view of the executive power, at least according to Mortensen, and I'm not so sure about John Harrison about this, uh, the executive power is a very thin grant of power. It's the power to carry Congress's laws into execution with whatever tools, officers, and other restrictions that Congress chooses to create. On this reading, according to Mortensen, for example, Congress should be able to create removal restrictions on executive officers. And of course, it goes without saying that there's no general foreign affairs power in the Constitution under this reading. Any missing foreign affairs powers uh, would be supplied by Congress via the Necessary and Proper Clause. Well, my paper argues that neither theory is quite right. My claim is that the executive power was indeed a single power. It was only the power to execute law. That much is right. But there is a thin version of this power and a thicker version of it. The thin version is articulated by Mortensen. The executive power is itself entirely defeasible, and Congress can, for example, assign specific duties to subordinate officers and insulate them from presidential removal. The thick version is the one my paper advances. The executive power is the power to execute law, but that power includes incidental, derivative, and component powers necessary to effectively exercise this executive power. For example, the powers to appoint, to direct, and to remove executive officers. My claim is that this thick understanding of the executive power to carry law into execution is the only reading of Article II's vesting clause that is consistent with textual evidence, evidence from the framing and ratification, and with post-ratification historical practice. Uh, to see why this reading is the only one that is consistent across these interpretive sources, consider how the two competing accounts each has a critical shortcoming. The residual vesting thesis is more consistent with some historical practice, like the early debates over the removal power, and maybe, I'm not actually sure about this, but maybe with the exercise of some presidential power in foreign affairs. But the residual thesis is otherwise totally implausible based on textual evidence and evidence from the Constitutional Convention and ratification. Uh, the textual evidence would take the longest to go through here, so I'll just tell you what my paper argues. If you look at all the uses, of the term the executive power in the singular, almost all of them, if not all of them, maybe there's one exception, seem to refer only to the power to execute law. 
Uh, there is some ambiguity, but the evidence, uh, in my view, strongly favors this law execution reading, particularly once uh, one disentangles this term, the executive power, from the term executive powers. Now, I can't get into all of that uh, in the 10 minutes that I have, but on top of this textual evidence, there's evidence from the Constitutional Convention. My paper highlights three points. The first, and this is well known, is that the convention's instruction to the Committee of Detail, the actual vote that is on the convention floor, was to grant the president only the power to execute law and to appoint officers not otherwise provided for. A residual vesting thesis requires us to believe that the Committee of Detail ignored this instruction. Second, the power to erect corporations was specifically rejected in the convention, most likely, there's some ambiguity here too, but most likely because the delegates did not want the national government to have this power to erect corporations. Yet the power to erect corporations was a royal prerogative power. If the re residual vesting thesis is right, the conclusion must be that while voting to the, deny the national government this power, not a single delegate was aware that that power would belong to the president anyway by virtue of this residual grant of power in the vesting clause. That seems to me to be totally implausible. Much more likely, they didn't see the vesting clause as a residual grant of royal prerogative powers at all. I'll just mention the third point, and I don't have to, time to get into it here, but a residual grant of power, my paper argues, is also inconsistent with the framers' <coughs> likely intent to vest Congress with the national immigration power, another historically uh, prerogative power, but that's trickier, and, and I'll leave that to the paper. Turning quickly to ratification, a fourth and well-known point is that not a single anti-federalist, even those most wary of executive power, so much as hinted at the possibility of residual grant of power. Even Michael McConnell acknowledges that this is a significant dog that did not bark. On the other, so those are the problems with, with that view. On the other hand, as I've already suggested, a thin reading of the executive power is inconsistent with at least some historical practice. A thick reading of the executive power to execute law, however, one in which the executive power includes incidental, derivative, and component powers necessary effectively to exercise the executive power is consistent with the textual evidence, the convention evidence, and with this historical practice. For example, the removal debates of 1789 are entirely consistent with a law execution reading of the executive power. The president cannot possibly execute the laws alone, and so must have assistance. The power to appoint such assistance, therefore, was part of the executive power to execute law. Indeed, Blackstone claims or wrote that the king had a power to create courts and to appoint judges to assist the king in exercising, quote, the executive power of the laws, end quote. And Madison and others argued in 1789, if the executive is to execute the law, the executive must also have the power to oversee, direct, and remove those officers that have been appointed to assist the president in doing so. In other words, this removal debate in 1789, often cited in favor of this residual vesting of executive power, does not in fact prove that proposition and is entirely consistent with this law execution view. I'm almost done. Okay. Blackstone also describes a proclamation power a power to issue executive orders and regulations, if you will, as to the, quote, manner, time, and circumstances of putting the laws in execution, end quote. As I argue in the paper, it is this proclamation power that explains the debate between Justice Black's majority opinion in Youngstown and Chief Justice Vinson's dissent. The question was whether seizing the steel mills was putting laws in execution or rather the making of new law. Chief Justice Vinson argued the former, Justice Black the latter. A residual grant of executive power has nothing to do with the issue in this case, nor for that matter does Justice Jackson's celebrated tripartite framework, which was completely ahistorical and does not deserve the praise it has received. The proclamation power, I'm glad you laughed at that line. <laughs> as, the proclamation power finally takes us to foreign affairs authority. Remember the neutrality proclamation? Residual theorists argue it's only explicable under a residual grant, quite the opposite. It's explicable under the thick view of the executive power to execute laws. Treaties are laws of the land. Washington had to decide whether the treaty between the US and France was in force in order to know how to enforce it. Once he decided upon the answer, he issued a proclamation as to the manner, time, and circumstance of putting this law in execution. This, by the way, also explains the power of treaty termination, at least where the conditions requiring termination can be ascertained. Okay, however, to be sure, the law execution reading 
Even this thick version cannot justify all claims of presidential power and foreign affairs, quite the opposite. What if setting foreign policy, for example? Well, for what it's worth, I argue that setting foreign policy is not a power at all. Anyone can speak. Monroe can announce the Monroe Doctrine. Tom Cotton, I guess, can write a letter to the Ayatollahs. Whether any constitutional actor has the constitutional power to make good on what they say is another matter entirely. So I really didn't give all of the evidence or implications here, but in conclusion, uh, uh, my claim is that the thick reading of the executive power is the best reading. It's the only one that is consistent with the text, the intent of the dele likely intent of the delegates, delegates, the silence of ratification, and most but not all historical practice. The upshot of this reading is that the president probably has more <coughs> robust authority in the domestic sphere than under this thin law execution account, but much less in foreign affairs than under the residual account. Thank you. All right, thank you. And Philip Hamburger will have commentary. Well, I feel rather intimidated sitting in the seat of John Harrison. Uh, I, I will not be as witty or as subtle, but that's okay. Uh, it's just who I am. I, I must begin by saying very bluntly that I am very sympathetic with this argument. Uh, I think it absolutely goes in the right direction, but not far enough. Uh, so. Let, let's consider first the, the, the main question here. Uh, what is executive power? What on earth is it? Is it just the leftover, what's left over from the others? Or is there some meaning to it? Um, the paper very nicely offers different theories. Um, one theory is that it's some combination of old prerogative powers. And I think quite correctly, that gets dismissed here. I, I dismiss it, you show that it's problematic. Uh, and that's not unreasonable because, because of course, the English had conceptions of executive power and we'll get back to that shortly. So it can't be just an accumulation of particulars. And then second, there's this theory that's become quite popular recently, not least in Mortensen's piece, that there is a law executing power, and that is executive power, and it has at least the advantage of having some overlap lingu linguistically. Ex you know, executive power, law executing, perhaps that's what it's all about. And then third, you offer the thick law executing uh, power. And I think very aptly the paper shows that if it is a law executing power, it has to be thick, not thin, because if it's thin, we have difficulty understanding actual executive power. We have difficulty even on the domestic side, because not all of it is narrowly executing the law. And when we get to foreign policy and war, gee, it becomes very complicated. So much of foreign policy is not exactly executing the law unless we have somewhat expansive vision of this, hence thin and thick. Um, that's great as far as it goes. But uh, forgive me for being just a little skeptical about the thin and the thick. Um, for one thing, these aren't the words the English use. I haven't read anything in the 18th century about the thick executive power in England. Um, and having been brought up at least partially in England, I must say that from an English point of view, the word thick has very different connotations. Um, <laughs> But be that as may, uh, what, what I'd like to do is actually throw out another uh, point of view, another vision of executive power. I could claim it is new, but it isn't. It's actually quite ancient, and I think that's to some advantage in these conversations. Um, that is, as the nation's lawful force, or sometimes it would be, say, the nation's lawful strength, or the action of the nation. Where does this come from? Uh, I, I, forgive me for going medieval, uh, but why not? Uh, in medieval times, there's a tripartite understanding of human faculties, or we would call them capabilities. Um, in the soul, substitute the word mind if you prefer, in the soul, there's will and judgment, the capacity to, to, to perceive, to judge, to understand, and the decision-making, the will. And these, are, these are, have no effect in the world but for the power of the body, which is its force, strength, or action. So the two <coughs> faculties of the mind or soul are, carry, are given effect by the body and its force, strength, or action. And by the way, before we just assume, oh, that's old medieval stuff, that's Aquinas, whatever, uh, it's, let's remember that in fact this is still, these distinctions are natural not only in the historical sense, but also 
perhaps in reality, they are still the foundation of a lot of decision-making theory, although that's not, this history is not understood. I'll take for an example one of the most important decision-making theories of the 20th century, the OODA loop, some of you will know it. Um, we had worse planes than the North Koreans in the 1950s. They had MiGs that were better than our planes, they could turn much more tightly. How did we win air battle after air battle? Because of the theory of the OODA loop, it's a doctrine uh, for Air Force pilots, observe, orient, uh, decide, and act. The observe and orient is the judgment, the decide, that's the will, and then the act, that's the, execu the execution, if you will. And because we could make decisions with tighter decisions within the OODA loop, within their OODA loop, um, we could actually make decisions before they've understood what was happening. We would win air battles. So this still matters. And what we see in the Middle Ages is this decision-making theory as they conceived it, judgment, will, and, and, and force, gets applied to government. Uh, the first instance of this, I didn't discover this, John Tierney did, um, 13, 15, Hervesis Natalis, the head of the Dominican Order, applies this tripart division to government. This is ancient stuff. Now, it's difficult to apply in England because the government's chopped up differently, but they're very much aware of it. Now, what about the evidence from 18th century America? There's a lot of commentary and executive power. Mortensen goes through a considerable amount of it. Uh, much of it supports a law executing point of view. But some of it goes in a different direction. Uh, I, I want to point out just, I'm going to take two quotations on this. First, Hamilton. Uh, it, by the way, in the Federalist Papers, which is not a bad citation for understanding the Constitution, you know, European theory is one thing, but the Federalist Papers, he talks about will, judgment, and force. I could just rest my case there, but I won't. Um, I, I just, I don't want to parse, I cannot parse Mortensen's evidence, but notice he mentions Rousseau, and this paper quotes Rousseau, and like much of Mortensen's evidence, it's actually not in support of his theory, but in support of the force theory, uh, which is kind of funny, I think. Um, so on page here, it's your page, <coughs> whoops, uh, page 16 is it? Here it is, I'm just gonna read to you from Rousseau. When I walk towards an object, it is necessary I first should resolve to go that way, that's will, and second, that my feet should carry me, that's force. The body politic has the same two motive powers, and we can make the same distinction between will and strength. The former is legislative power, the latter executive power. You get the idea. So there is evidence out there for an alternative point of view that I think is worth discussing. You may agree with it. I think your evidence actually is consistent with that force theory. Um, you may not want to go that far. That's up to you, but I just want to point out it'd be worth discussing uh, force. I've written a few paragraphs on this, but I have not explored it in depth. If I have a minute left, um, I just want to turn to the question of proclamations, which has appeared in prior work of yours. Um, it's interesting, but I, I think it's wrong, and forgive me, I, I want to emphasize that. Um, why not? Um, so the argument is that royal proclamations are justification for agency rulemaking. And the, this argument relies on Blackstone, but I think it misunderstands the history. Um, Blackstone indeed says, lawmaking is the work of the legislative branch, yet the manner, time, and circumstances of putting those laws into execution must frequently be left to the discretion of the executive mag magistrate in proclamations. I'm not sure that putting laws into execution is really much more than you know, enforcement. Um, you also quote, Blackstone, that the king's proclamations are binding on the subject where they do not either contradict old laws, et cetera, et cetera. But um, the idea that, uh, that proclamations are binding reverts back to an early 17th century dicta that's were then reported by <coughs> Cook. Um, it's a theory. I don't know of a case that actually carries it out. In Viner's abridgment, you can't find cases that carry it out. I think it's a royalist theory that he still mentions, but it's not actually the law as lived. Or, um, but that's not all. Proclamations are a terrible precedent for agency rules because royal proclamations are inherent in royal power in the king himself. They're only made by the king in council. It's not delegated or agency or expert rule. It's the proclamation from the king. And so it's actually the opposite of agency or expert decision making. This is the power only of the king and it, it, it cannot therefore be viewed as a precedent for agency rulemaking. So I think it's a very interesting paper. I go, it goes very much in the right direction. I would just encourage you to go one step further. Thank you.
<coughs> okay, so we have about 10 minutes for commentary. I first want to open it up to any members of the panel who'd like to comment on any of the papers they have not already commented on. Right, forgive me, you're getting a, a, double, a double dose. Um, because I, I also was thinking of commenting uh, uh, on, on Christian's paper. Um, and let me find my notes for this. Oh, right, so I, I don't know much about metalinguistics, uh, but uh, it does strike me that if one's going to talk about, um, here, here we get thin, thin and thick uh, again, um, <laughs> uh, visions of the rule of law, whether they be versions of the same or different things, um, when I think about the thick one, um, it's not just particularistic. Um, the traditional vision in not only England, but also much of the continent, was involved in accountability up to God, through natural law, and down to the people through <coughs> community decision making, election of lawmakers and juries. And that accountability up and down is what's been stripped away in modern law when we get to pos the positivism that, that Larry moved to. So I think there's a risk in the paper that you tell a story about the rise of ideas of certainty and generality, whereas in fact, and it's a little strained there, and it seems to me rather the story might be the loss of natural law and popular participation. Just a slight adjustment in tone. And then, if, just a little bit more. Um, I think this paper, it's a very provocative, interesting paper. It made me think a lot about the subject. And I confess what it made me think is that there's this paper, and then there's a bigger story you can tell, um, which is how did we get the thin rule of, rule of law, whatever you want to call it. And I don't think it's just the colonies. And let me just give you a quick version of the history as I see it thinking after reading your for your interesting paper. I think there are five elements. One might include, there probably are more. One, you'd want to look at uh, medieval treatment of local custom and royal charters, right? Because these were legal systems within the polity. It isn't common law. And you know, this is where we get the notion of judgment in one's own case being applied in English law. DEC Yale has a wonderful article on this. Bonham's case is a reflection of this too. There's a thinner version of English law that's applied to uh, localities. Second, when we want to think about enforcement of foreign judgments, so in a typical late 17th century case, will a, a judgment of a commercial court in Lyon be enforced in King's Bench? And again, it's a thin vision of, of law. Um, then you've got the colonies, which reinforces this all the more and raises it up to legal theory, which is really good. Um, and then fourth, and here we really get to legal theory, I think you'd have to consider um, Prussian-inspired rejections of natural law and rejections of popular foundations of law. And this is where Bentham gets his positivism, right? Uh, Bentham, he doesn't go whole hog on the anti-populism, but he certainly rejects natural law. He's read the Prussian code and the, and the Russian code, and Th this is where this comes into English law. And then fifth, I think one has to think about the history of the Reichstag, which is where I think we really get the, the, the rule of law idea. And you know, before 1848, uh, German liberals thought they could have a genuine um, system of law with an elected legislature making all the laws, uh, and even possibly some of them wanted juries. That dies in 1848, right, with the loss of revolutions. And uh, they then moved to a thin version, which is, well, let's have administrative judges who are not too biased, and that's it. <laughs> and I just have a quick comment on the Hollis's paper. So um, I'm not sure that I agree that um, the extended mind sort of thesis as, as originally developed uh, by David Chalmers and Andy Clark applies in uh, hypos where we have uh, a deep learning system, right? So uh, the, the hypo that you, you changed the names, but Inga and Otto are driving, right? Inga uh, uh, is accessing memories encoded neurally. Otto, who has Alzheimer's, has to write it down. So, uh, Chalmers and Clark argue that the written directions are part of uh, uh, Otto's mind because, and in their words, it is constantly and immediately accessible to Otto and automatically endorsed by him because, of course, he created it. So in a deep learning scenario, Right, the, uh, co the processes, the functional processes that the deep learning system employs are not similar 
immediately accessible and automatically endorsed. So they fail the criteria that Clark and, uh, uh, and Chalmers establish for what is part of the extended mind. So it, it just, it's, it's, it, it, just one other little tiny thing, which is that, um, and I think it's very important then to separate all of that off from the artificial person uh, group agent problems that um, exist in the corporate context. Those are, those, are, that those are separate problems that actually Chalmers and Clark address when they talk about socially extended minds. So there, there might be some purchase here from, on, from the extended mind hypothesis on this other problem which is implicated in uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, business association examples that you're discussing. <coughs> We have a few minutes. Oh, did you want to respond? I, I could, but there, uh, there are what? a lot of comments. So oh, why don't we take I'll, some I'll questions? Later. Steve Calabresi. Uh, okay. I have, uh, a series of questions for Elon and for Christian. Uh, first for Elon. <laughs> I was expecting uh, this. Yes. <laughs> uh, for Elon, um, I wonder how you would treat the executive power in a case like N. Ray Nagel. In In re Nagel, there was no federal statute empowering the president to protect the life of Supreme Court Justice Stephen Field. Uh, the Attorney General dispatched a U.S. Marshal to protect Field. The U.S. Marshal shot and killed a man named David Terry who was trying to assassinate Field. He sought to remove his case to federal court, but could only do so if he had murdered Terry in pursuance of a law of the United States. And the other Supreme Court justices, minus Field, said the president had inherent power under the vesting clause to protect the lives of Supreme Court justices. So that's one question about uh, the scope of the vesting clause. Another question about the scope of the vesting clause is the things that Abraham Lincoln did between March 4th, 1861 and July 4th, 1861, when he summoned Congress into special session. There was a national emergency. It wasn't safe to convene Congress in Washington, D.C., because Maryland might have seceded and the district could have been behind enemy lines. So Lincoln unilaterally suspended the writ of cabeus corpus. He issued a naval blockade on the South, and he raised 600,000 troops. And then he went to Congress on July 4th, 1861, saying, I'm so sorry to have acted but I had to in order to preserve the possibility of your being able to get together and adopt what I did. Please retroactively authorize everything I did. They did that. I think Lincoln was able to do that under the executive, uh, under the executive prerogative. A third example of the executive prerogative, which seems to me legitimate, contrary maybe to what Philip was suggesting, was George Washington's issuance of the Neutrality Proclamation. The Neutrality Proclamation declared that although the United States had a treaty of alliance with France arrived at under King Louis XVI, the United States was construing that treaty as void because there was a new French revolutionary regime. And Washington directed that all district attorneys prosecute offenses against the law of nations by Americans who violated the neutrality between the United States and France and the United States and Britain. So I'm curious about that as an example of a thicker understanding of the vesting clause. My questions for Christian are, um, my impression of, uh, I've done extensive studying of the colonial period and also of the British imperial period with the Privy Council. And what that revealed was that in 1641, when Charles I fatally called the Long Parliament into session, which ended up executing him, the Long Parliament immediately passed a law extinguishing the royal prerogative in the Kingdom of England and Wales. But the royal prerogative remained in the Isle of Man, the Channel Islands, and the North American colonies. And so the King of England, through his Privy Council, governed the Isle of Man, the Channel Islands, and the North American colonies. 
And the rule that the Privy Council followed was that it struck down any laws that the colonies passed that were, quote, repugnant to the laws of England. After the restoration under Charles II, uh, the Privy Council continued to review American colonial court decisions and laws and rejected those that were repugnant to the laws of England, but allowed laws that seemed authorized due to different circumstances in the colonies. So for example, uh, the American colonies got rid of primogeniture, but uh, they were allowed to do that because there was so much free land that there was no need for primogeniture in the American colonies. By the 1760s, the American colonies believed, rightly or wrongly, that they shared a king with England and Wales, but they didn't share a parliament with England and Wales. They were like the Duchy of Hanover, if you will. And their lower houses, their state assemblies, and their state councils were their legislature. So they thought they were subject to rule by King George III, but free of rule by parliament. And of course, that's why the Declaration of Independence is full of denunciations of things George III did, but silent on the question of what the colonies did. Later in the British Empire in 1833, the Privy Council was reformed with the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council Act. It was turned into a highly professionalized court and its decisions were made binding on Queen Victoria. And uh, during that period, Britain had enacted a statute called the Colonial Laws Validity Act, which said that all laws passed in the colonies were valid unless they were repugnant to the laws of England. The key move in the colonies becoming independent was the adoption of the Statute of Westminster in 1931, which repealed the Colonial Laws Validity Act and extinguished British power to legislate domestically as to uh, India or Canada or South Africa or the other British dominions. So um, I, I guess uh, my questions for Ilan are pretty straightforward. My question for you is really, um, to what extent do you think that the framers uh, thought they were bound by parliament prior to the 1760s, or did they always think they were only bound by the king and the privy council? And was this deferential judicial review of striking down laws that are repugnant to the laws of England, in essence, a recognition of a kind of federalism in the American empire? Thank you. We can have brief responses, and then we're going to have to wrap up. Uh, thanks uh, <laughs> for staying a bit over. Uh, I know we're all waiting to go to a reception, so thank you for being with us till the bitter end. Um, I'll divide, I guess, those kind of four examples in, into two each very quickly. I think the giving the security to Justice Field was unlawful. I think it was unconstitutional. So was the suspension of habeas corpus. And I'd rather just acknowledge that sometimes government actors do unconstitutional things than try to justify it under some expansive view of the executive power that then gives them authority to do all sorts of other things. Uh, even Lincoln acknowledged the suspension was unconstitutional. And, you know, he was okay chopping off a finger to save the body, right, uh, as, uh, and so on. And I, I don't know what the laws were, but in, in Ray Nagel, uh, but you know, if Congress didn't supply any appropriations, didn't establish any officers for security for any government personnel, could the president, in, through inherent executive power, ha have you know uh, impaneled someone to come or, or, or commandeered someone to serve as security or privately hired someone? I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. The naval blockade probably could be under a commander-in-chief clause if a state of war already existed. I mean, that, that's just me relying on the prize cases. Um, and as for the laws of nations, you know, the Constitution itself and whatever other laws are out there are also laws to be executed, right, as part of the executive power, as long as we can establish that they're, in fact, laws that are out there, which maybe they're not. Maybe that was the mistake, but it was not an executive power problem, I think. But those, I, I, all of those things I don't mention in the paper, and I should. So thank you. <laughs> Uh, I'll just focus on the repugnancy question in the interest of time. Uh, I don't think it was, it was proto, I mean, Mary Bilder has written very uh, eloquently about this, uh, but I don't think it was so much proto-federalism as one, an extension of what was already going on within England. So in England itself, laws, local laws varied. So for example, um, some places had gavel kind, some places did not. I think it was just an extension of that sort of uh, recognition that even the common law had local customs that challenged it. Um, it was also you know, an extension, as Bill has written, of sort of uh, 
early corporate law doctrine, the idea that you were delegating some kind of authority, and that means on one hand that the local uh, colonial governments have, have, have to have some discretion to act independently, but that, that's gotta be reined in by, by judicial review. So I'm not sure it's proto-federalism as much as, as, as sort of an extension of principles already existing in England to the colonial setting. Many thanks to all of our present pre presenters and all of our panelists and moderators. Thank you.